and life is about that. But the trilemmas, boy, that's a good-looking picture of that man right there. <laughs> Amen. The, I rode my scooter yesterday. I just told him, well, I got to ride, man. I got to ride. I just got to get out of here. Thank you, Lord. My sister-in-law's visiting. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. I won't say it in the second service. She'll be there. Uh, but the trilemma is, is three things that took place. And right after the resurrection, there were three things that took place. One of them was an unoccupied tomb. They went to the grave. And look, I, where I'm from in North Alabama, there are cemeteries where my dad, now uh, where his body is, my dad's not there, but there is a, there's a tomb there. Eh? And it's a, uh, back in the day, let's say in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they buried people, they would have these, um, uh, they would fashion their own gravestones. And it, it wasn't this stamped out that you see today. And this one grave is, is literally slabs of rock and then two slabs of rock laid on top. You got that? And there's a crack in the top of it. And it, as a little boy, I would go there and, I, and, and you had to get your nerve up. But I would go and I'd peek in <laughs> at the top of that. And, you know, and it's so dark in there. But, but it's something about going to the grave and looking inside there. And I couldn't tell anything was in there. Amen. It's like, well, surely there's something inside there. So when we first realize that there's an un unoccupied tomb, they put him in there. We know they put him in there. They rolled a rock in front of it. They had soldiers that guarded it. Amen. So there's an unoccupied tomb. The second thing we see right after is his empty grave clothes. When they did get inside of it, because the, the stone got rolled away. How many know all those men rolled that stone away? No. Who rolled the stone away? The, the angels rolled the stone away. Matter of fact, the angels were such smart, Alex, after they rolled it away, they sat on top of it. They waited on people to show up. So the second thing we see is that empty grave clothes. They went in. Jesus didn't keep those clothes. So here's, here's, do you think like me? So if he was wrapped in those clothes, and now the clothes are still there, and next time we see him, he's clothed, where did he get the clothes after he was unclothed? Do you think like me? In other words, when we get to heaven, or however this thing's going to work out, God's going to make sure we're covered. Can I get an amen? Then the third thing that took place was the uncanny appearances, where he just showed up. A couple weeks ago, I preached to you about the road to Emmaus, where two guys were walking along, two of the disciples. Jesus came up along next to him. Remember that? And he said to them, he said, uh, hey, what are y'all talking about? And they said, you hadn't heard that Jesus that, that came and he died? Amen. And they began to talk, and they were sad. They were down. They were seven miles from Jerusalem. Do y'all remember that? Remember that? If you, if you pay attention to me, you'll remember that. Amen. And so they're away, seven miles away. And Jesus says to him, begins to talk to them about him. And he starts in Genesis and he lays out who he was all through the Bible. And the scripture says, did not our hearts burn within us when we realized who was talking to us? And when they turned around and they said, Jesus, before they could get the second syllable out, which was this, uh, Jesus disappeared. Now, that's an uncanny appearance. But he also showed up inside of a locked room. Trilemma. And before I finish today, I'm going to talk to you about the trilemma that everybody struggles with, and you did too. When you think about the man Jesus, he's either Lord, or either he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. And if you want to defend the gospel, pick up on those three words. Because your friends and your family have to decide, is he Lord of all, or is he a really good liar? Because he'd have to be a really good liar, because he said he came from heaven. He said his father created everything. Matter of fact, he said, me and my father are one. You've seen daddy, you've seen me. So he's either a great liar, or he's a lunatic. Because what he said and believed led him to the plucking of his beard, the beating of his back, and the crucifixion on the cross. He was crazy. You've got to pick one. I pray you're challenged already. John 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, 11 of them, where the doors locked. Everybody say locked. 
for fear. What was it that Jesus always tried to help the disciples get over? Fear, 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 battling fear. Now they got fear again. Fear of the Jews, man fear. Man fear, worst fear you can have, man fear. Being afraid of what other people think about you. Always asking their opinion. Look, <coughs> quit, Jerry. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace. When you got fear, what do you need? Peace. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands, his side, lifted up that shirt. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I love John 20, 20. Because 2020 tells me you got perfect vision. The doctors told me after these implants, I now have 2020 vision. So John 2020 means a lot to me. They saw the Lord. Seeing's believing. Can I get an amen? amen? Father, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen. God bless you. May be seated. Let's talk about first this unoccupied tomb. Early in the first day of the week, John 20, verse 1, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, I mean early in the morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She knew the stone was there. She knew what the cemetery looked like. So she was going there to perhaps flowers, perhaps meditation, reflection. When she got there, she saw the stone had been removed. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. What book are we reading? John. Who was the disciple that Jesus loved? Who said that? John. Yeah. And he said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but one of the disciples was faster than Peter, John. And reached the tomb first. To get to the tomb, they go in, and he, there's an unoccupied. There's not, you can imagine the shock. Let's talk about the, the re re reflection again. Did not Jesus say that they're going to take this body in three, day, in three days, it's going to come back again? They're going to tear it down, I'm coming back. Did, did he not say that over and over again? not talk about going and being with his father amen all these things he said to them but now it's 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 like we use the word revelation it's just i mean when it finally clicks and in your life my life there are times that things just don't click just yet but all of a sudden things come together and it's clicking when they walk in it's empty so now they got these theories these theories were this and this literally is historical that these brave dis disciples stole his body now we just read in john chapter 20 verse 19 and 20 that the disciples were what scared in fear they were nervous they were they were afraid so let's just go ahead and kick them out that it was not the disciples who stole his body second it took many men to roll this stone in front of the tomb so the disciples were unable to move that stone third there were guards guarding the tomb see as a matter of fact these guards have if they were not careful they're going to die because if Jesus escapes or if something happens or he's gone, it's going to perpetuate this gospel story. And then, of course, Pilate and, and, and all those involved in the courts there would, would kill the guards. Another one said that he played possum. Now, if you know anything about possums, as soon as you act like you're going to kill them, they just lay there and get steel. Now, possums are the God. Is, he put quills on porcupines. He put, he put puff in frogs. You ever seen a frog puff up? Look bigger than what it is when something comes toward it? God puts these defense mechanisms in, in, uh, in all type of animals to keep them secure. Possum, he had to really think. I mean, it was probably the last thing on the list. And God said, all right, what are we going to do with this little guy? I'll tell you what, we'll just let him act dead. And possums can act dead. A dog can chew on a possum. And he ain't going to move. 
He can feel the pain, and he's not going to let it go. So they believe Jesus swooned. That was the term for it, that he swooned. He literally played possum, amen, on the cross. And when they put him there, he revived. In other words, he faked his death. It's a good cowboy story. You act like you're shot, and you lay there, and they roll you over, and then you shoot him. Amen. It's that swooning moment, you know, where he just swooned. He's not dead. Well, hold on. They pierced him. They put a spear into his side. He poured blood. He even said he gave up his spirit. Amen. He laid down his life. They couldn't even take it. He gave it up at that moment. So there's no way that you can believe at this moment. So the only biblical fact that I know here is that he rose. Amen. He did run, and, and that the stone was rolled away by the angels. There was a visitation in there. In other words, and I've, I've, I've used this phrase quite often, Jesus was not buried, but he was planted. He was put in like seed into the ground, and on the third day, he planted, he bloomed, he came out. So in other words, at this moment, we understand that, that this theory was so wrong, the tomb was unoccupied. It's still unoccupied today. You can go to Israel right now and go into the very same tomb where they think Jesus was. Was, and there's nobody there. But any other God, any other prophet, any one of them, you can go find their bones today. There's still a place for them. You can't find Jesus. Can't find He wrote. So second thing we realize is the grave clothes. When they got inside there, verse 5 says, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but they did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. Why was he behind? Because he ran slower. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside, saw and believed. Now, first of all, let me just say, if I outran you to get somewhere, I'm going in. Huh? Come on. I mean, the whole reward outrunning you is getting in there where Mary said that, that they took his body. So here's John. He outside. He's a little skeptical. But all of a sudden, Peter goes on in and finds the grave clothes, amen, are laying there, and they're folded up. And of course, this is his lifeless body. I, I read about this, that Nicodemus, remember Nick at night? Nick showed up with Jesus at night. He was a Pharisee. John chapter 3. Nick had to ask, he's, he's a religious man. He said, what can a man do to be born again? And that's where the famous scripture is in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave me his only begotten son, and whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come in here to beat us up. Amen. I, guys, I was only kidding about the air conditioning. This is getting cold in here. Uh, I, I was talking about tombs, man. All of a sudden, I felt like... Sorry, Marie, you cuddle up here. Uh, I know you was. I've got to be careful what I say. Uh, you went inside there and clothes are folded. It's, it's a, you know, and again, it's, uh, we've mentioned this a hundred times, but the Jewish tradition was that any time that you, you left your, your plate, that if you were done with your plate you just wad your napkin up and throw it on your plate and and then they would know that they could take their plate away but if you ever left your plate and you folded your napkin amen and you you were proper with it and you laid it beside you your plate there and you set it out there then 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 when the mater d or the waiter came and saw that folded napkin he he would know that you're coming back So when Jesus left the tomb, he folded his napkin so that all those who understood the custom would know, I'm coming back. I'm going to see you again. Amen. I'm not finished with you. I'm, I'm coming back. So here we find his clothes are folded. Then, then the uncanny appearances, which, which I, I love. <laughs> When you love a visit from your daddy again? Well, this morning I woke up and I got a message from a young man named Alan. And uh, Alan Atkins works for Budweiser. His daddy worked for Budweiser. His dad was one of my best friends and worship leader that I hired years ago. 
His daddy was a first learned worship at Gillies. Picked a Gibson and his son sent me the picture and he said, it was you that coined the phrase, the worship leader from Gillies. He sent me a picture of Bill Atkins playing music with Johnny Paycheck at Gillies. He said, I found his picture and he sent it. Wouldn't it be cool for me to get to see Bill again? He passed away a few years ago for you just to come back. Every one of you have somebody you know that you would love to see come back from the other side to visit you. Now, Peter and John recognize that Jesus ain't there. The clothes are folded. It's after the resurrection. They're locked into a house, scared because the Jews, they're fearful of the Jews. They've locked the door, amen, to make sure that, that everything's going to be fine. Then the disciples, they went back to their homes after this. They had to share the news that he wasn't there. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over and she looked in the tomb. And I see, she, ain't, she found a stone rolled away, but she didn't go in. She went and told Peter and John. But now she's hurt. He's in. So she looks into the tomb and saw two angels in white. Now, it doesn't say that Peter and John saw the two angels. So they have left, and now two angels show up. This is, this is all crazy. Isn't it? Amen. So where Jesus' body had been, one sitting at the head and one other sitting at the foot. Amen. And they ask a woman, so they talk. Angels talk. They say stuff. They say, woman, why are you crying? Look, you know, that, that tells me that these were angels and they were not men. Man, never ask a woman why she's crying. <laughs> if you've been with a woman long enough, you know better than ask her why she's crying. A woman crying anytime she wants for any reason she wants. She ain't got to have a reason. And for you to ask her it means that you ain't learning nothing. Then why are you crying? They said, well, they've they taken my Lord away. She said, now, I don't know where they put him. <laughs> At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She didn't recognize it. I love this. See, he can come across as a biker, a gearhead, a musician. He can come across as any ethnicity. He, man, he, you don't know. And he, so he speaks to her. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? <laughs> Thinking he was the gardener. That's funny. She thought he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I'll get him. Now, again, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, Mary, well, you, you got to understand, the stones rolled away. You just saw two angels. Now you're asking me where he's at. So he said to her, Mary, she turned, it's your name, Justin. When he says your name. See, your name is so important that when you were given a name at birth, God never forgot your name. Now, you can be stupid through life and mentally deranged and change your name. You can get a Section 8 clinger. But it's your name that he's going to call you when you get home. And when you hear your name, Mary, whew, it was in Aramaic. She, Raboni, which means teacher, she recognized, amen, at that moment. And everything changed. And Jesus said, and so, so it's, you read this, he said, don't hold on to me. It's like he had to stop her. She's she going to go get her a hug. Whoa, woman, be careful, back off. For I have not yet returned to my father. Now, I don't know if that is because, and again, I don't have to know all the answers, neither do you. But I, I got this thing about he had to want to go hug daddy first. Amen. Make sure that was the first hug you got. So go instead to my brothers and tell him, I'm returning to my Father, amen, and to my God. And I'm going to my Father and, oh my goodness, your God. Amen. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. To Mary, listen, I'm going to my Father and to your Father. Seeing is healing. There's something about it. You remember when Jesus shows up? We're going to talk about it here in just a minute. He shows his hands. He shows his side. Psalm 147, 3 says he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. There's something about all of our lives. At times we get our hearts broken. Or we have wounds in our life. 
That's what he does. He heals us, and he healed her. Amen. And he can look like just anybody. That's why I love the fact that you don't have to be dressed. People used to say, you dress like a Christian. They never said that to me. But, but others, <laughs> because the way they looked, you know, in times, and I don't know what is a Christian supposed to look like. What are they supposed to look like? How are we supposed to be? Uh, it's, it's not what's outside, it's what's inside. So Jesus, then he appears to his disciples in verse 19 on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together. We've read this, locked in fear for the Jews. He came and he stood among them and said, peace be with you. You've been afraid. Now I want you to be, I want you to be okay. After he said this, he showed them his hands, his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. There there were 11 wounded soldiers and a Savior with scars. His hands, his feet. So these appearances that took place were healing in their lives. Now let me get to this third, last point because I got a lot to cover here. Lock, by the way, locked room. Let me get back to this. The room was locked. And it always gets me. He didn't come through the door because he is the door. Oh. Amen. He's the door. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. I'm the door to the sheepfold. I am that one. I'm the door. So he's the threshold in which we're going to cross over someday. So he never came through. He walked through the wall. There's not one of you in this room that have not once thought about in a movie that you watched, you wish you couldn't just walk through the wall. You watched Invisible Man? I remember watching the Invisible Man when I was a little boy. They didn't have the what they got today. I remember uh, what was cool about it is you could see his tracks in the snow. That's the only way you knew it was the invisible man coming toward you. Today they got all kind of good CG whatever stuff. But then that was the best they could do. Put a little head. Boy, and walking through walls. Can you imagine that? That you have the ability to sit, the ability to worship, the ability to eat, and yet, the ability to walk through a wall? You think, you think? Yes, I think. I think the way he is, the way we're going to be. So he just walks right through the wall. Comes right in, hangs out with them. You think they were afraid of the Jews? Imagine how they felt when they turned around and Jesus was standing there. That's why he had to say peace. <laughs> you scared of cats. John 8, verse 48. Lord, liar, lunatic. Jesus claimed to be God. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Hold on a minute. My mama's Jew, my adopted father's a Jew, and you're going to call me a Samaritan? That's not calling me a Yankee. <laughs> you know I'm from Alabama. You know I whistle Dixie. Amen. You know I drive a Dodge Charge and slide around uh, curves. You know all about, you know, you hear what I'm saying? They were slamming him. They said, you're a Samaritan and you demon possessed. He said, I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If anybody keeps my words, he will never see death. Now, Jesus is fixing to tell him he's God. He's fixing to lay it out here. At this, the Jews explained, now we know that you're demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Hear me. Understand this. Jews and Muslims all go back to Abraham. They all look at Abraham as the father. There's nothing greater than the prophet Abraham. Amen. Uh, the father of Ishmael, the father of Isaac. They always go back to Abraham. So when these Jews throw out Abraham, they throw out Big Daddy here. So he, Jesus said, and they said, he died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. And if I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham, I love this, your daddy, your spiritual father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, they said. Yeah, I mean, you say you've seen Abraham. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Remember who he is. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
This is the only truth that I know to be absolute. So he says to them, at this to them, before Abraham was born, I was. I am. I'm the word. In the beginning was the, and the word was, was God. Amen. And with God. I was there then. I was there when Abraham was born. I saw him as a baby. Amen. I saw him take Isaac to the top of a mountain. I saw him pull. I'm the one that sent the ram up on the other side of the mountain to make sure Abraham didn't kill his little boy. Before Abraham was, I am. Well, now we in trouble. At this, they picked up rocks to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Amen. Jesus came to show us the Father. When you see Jesus, you see Daddy. Amen. He asks us to believe in Him. John 14, 1, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and we're not so I would have told you. He asked for us to accept, uh, to accept Him and to worship Him. That's why we worshiped Him this morning. It's so important to understand that He said that He was God. So who do you say that I am? That's the question. Well, there's three choices. The first choice, He's liar. He's got to be a liar. That's what they said. They thought Jesus was a liar. Amen. He knew his claims were false. He deliberately misrepresented himself and the kingdom. When he, then he was a hypocrite. If he's a liar, then he's a hypocrite. He told others to be honest, but himself was teaching and living a colossal lie. Well, if he's a hypocrite, then he was a demon. They even said that he was demonic, that he, had a, he must have had a demon in it. So he told others to trust him for their eternal destiny. If he couldn't back up his claim and he knew it, then he was, ha, had unspeakable evil. If I told you that if you live for God, you love Jesus, you trust in him, and I don't know that Jesus actually rose from the dead, what kind of preacher am I? What am I teaching you? I'm, I'm, I'm demonic and de uh, a hypocrite and a liar. So here, this moment, and if he's that, then he's a fool. For it was his claim of being God that led to his crucifixion. You said you were God. That's what got him in trouble. That, that's, the, that's what started the whole thing. When they finally pinned him down, he said, that's what you say I am. Amen. You say, <laughs> then I am. So someone who lived as Jesus, lived and taught as Jesus, taught and died as Jesus, amen, could not have been a liar. Well, he had to be crazy. Must have been a lunatic. Lunar tick. It's when the moon is full. Right? Lunar. And it has a pull of the ocean. And what happens during that time? Women give birth. Pulling that baby. Uh-huh. Come on. I talk to nurses and doctors. They tell me that. But when that moon gets full, oh, the werewolves come out. Yeah, see, I told you I watched a lot of scary movies when I was little. So when that moon's full, when everything starts taking place, that's when, and they tell me, at, and I'm not trying to be mean, but at psychiatric centers, that when that moon is full, folk get a little nuts. They start getting a little crazy. Amen. Things start happening. So he's a lunatic. He must be crazy. He did not know his claims. See, the thing about <laughs> the thing about being that, that's wild about being crazy is you don't know it. You don't realize you're crazy. That, that's the thing about it, Keith. <laughs> you, just, you just don't know it. You, know? you, you can't pick up. Uh, uh, so it's, it's possible to be sincere and to be sincerely wrong. Come on up, Jojo. Amen. Sincere. So there were claims that he claimed if he was crazy. This is what Jesus said about himself. He's crazy. First, creator, savior, raise the dead, judge, light, shepherd, the glory of God, first and last, redeemer, bridegroom, rock, forgiver of sins, worshiped by angels, creator of angels, confessed as Lord, king of kings, amen. He said all that about himself. So if he's crazy, he's really crazy. Amen. Some of you, some folks get crazy and they just sit, they say one thing about it. He said a whole lot about it. He said, I'm Alpha Omega, I'm the beginning and the end. Amen, I'm, I'm, I'm the uh, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He threw all these things out about himself. So either he's liar, lunatic, or is he Lord? And this is where we've got to break it down. See, you can't put him on a shelf and just call him a moral teacher. My daughter right now, I will promise you that Joseph, Pastor Joseph and the guys in Guatemala, they talking with people. They're not just building houses. That's just an excuse to talk to people about the gospel. 
My daughter's talking to people about the gospel. You're talking to people about the gospel. When you talk with people, people will say he was a great moral. The Muslims will say he was a great moral teacher. Hindus will say the same thing. He's more than a moral teacher. He lived. He died. Did miracles. Died and rose again. Amen. He's Lord. Then Jesus told them, verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, that's you and me, who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in their presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. Amen. So when I read that, I think to myself, well, I got a choice. Either he's a liar, or either he's crazy, or he's Lord. And if you choose him as Lord, it changes your whole life. Now, many of us have chosen him as Savior. And I understand that. You're a believer in Christ. You picked up on him. You said, Lord, I just want to believe you. But when you go, when you take another step, everybody say take another step. When you take another step with him, you find a different level of life living. You start living another level of life. You start seeing, and it's not to condemn anybody else that's just believers and he's Savior. And you say, well, pastors, there's two different salvations. No, but there are the degrees of your salvation. The scripture talks about line upon line, precept upon precept growing a little bit more yeah you started out as a baby you don't get to stay as a baby you don't keep getting away with stuff as a baby you got to become an adolescent you get hair under your arms you start growing man and then all of a sudden you become an adult now you hit another level what happens when you become adult you have to be responsible don't you i love it changes everything boy if you'd only known you would have lived it maybe a little different when you was a teenager. Amen. Lordship means three things. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to throw them at you very quickly. Except in the future regardless of the cost. You don't know what the future is. But when he becomes Lord of all, you accept it. God, let me tell you what's ahead of my future. Pain. Suffering. Loss. Before I leave this planet, some of you will leave before me. And I will feel that loss. I have to accept that there may be floods. I could lose my home. I could lose family members. There's things ahead that resemble struggle. And I have to accept Him as Lord. It's not all coffee in the mornings. It's not all pretty songs on the radio. There's some things ahead for all of us. So when I accept him as Lord, Jesus said in Luke 9, 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, Hey, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds have nests. Son of man ain't got a place to lay his head. You sure you don't follow me? I ain't even got a home. I don't even have a place. You got a U-Haul trailer? I have nothing to put in it. So I'm telling you, lordship is accepting the future regardless of the cost. Second, it's seizing the moment regardless of the inconvenience. Luke 9, 50, 59, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. I know some of you read that and you say, man, it's almost cruel what he said. But Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my dad. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, he's not being heartless. He understands there has to be burial. The problem is this. You are selfish, and I am selfish. Whenever we allow the passing of a loved one, a friend, to keep us in such a state that we're no longer able to minister or love anybody that's still living. See, i got to deal with the living. I can't change what died. I can't turn it around. So if he's Lord, i got to suck it up. And say, God, help me deal with what's alive right now. My memories are that it's inconvenience, but you're my Lord. So I accept you. And the last point, leaving the past regardless of the pull. There's always something pulling on you. There's always something trying to pull you back. I live in the past in my mind. In my mind, I am 10 foot tall and bulletproof. In my mind, you can't destroy this body. And then I wake up. And I realize I too am getting old. Life's shifting for me. 
Jesus, Luke 9, verse 61. Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Listen, if you go back to your family and say goodbye, you're going to stay there. You're not going to follow. He's just laying it out. He's not against family. He's not against burial. He's not against you having a home. But he's saying, I ain't got a home. He said, I, 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 I didn't even go to John's funeral. John got beheaded. I didn't even show up at his funeral. I just told John, to t- I told the disciples, tell John I'll see him later on the other side. Hear me? He's not just stuck here. But then he lays out this lordship part uh, about no matter the past and the pull, I can't go back. Uh, still another said, I'll follow you. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom. When I was a kid, we plowed. We didn't have horses. We were rich. We had a tiller. And I'd get out there on that tiller. I don't know if we ever had anything new. My dad always had old stuff. And you'd get out there on that tiller, and you, you flipped that switch forward, and you held hold of it. And my dad would have way down... Way down at the end of the, way down at the end of the row, my dad would put, he'd he'd put, he he'd, he'd throw a, a, something down at the end of the row. He he'd throw it down there. He said, "Y'all pick that up for me." Amen. He he throw it down at the end of the row, and then he'd say, "Now look, that I put down there a, 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 a tag, it says corn on it, corn. Now put it back. Thank you, Mitch. Just lay it in the middle of, of the aisle there. Put it down in the middle, Mitch. Put it in the middle of the aisle, Mitch. Thank you. And so you get on the tiller, and you keep your eye on that." patch on that on that sign down there that said corn and you till and you till and you had to be careful because somebody come running up to you jerry jerry hey you want to go smoke this yeah (laughs) and the next thing you know you're out of the you're out of the way and so then you go oh my god i gotta get back to sunday okay sunday and now you're plowing again, and you're rolling. And all of a sudden, you hear it again. Jerry, Jerry, hey, Susie said she'll go out with you. Susie said what? And then, you, then you're over here. And, then, then, and, then, and then, uh, then your dad comes out and says, my God, boy, look at this row. Look at this row. What happened? I got a little distracted. When you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Past is calling. Don't look back. Keep rolling. He's Lord. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, the challenge has been put forth. The hearts of your people have heard it. You showed up after the resurrection. You validated it. You validated the cross. You validated a life well lived. You spoke to your disciples and gave them that powerful word, peace again. You, was, you saw Mary. Whoo! God, she loved you. She poured alabaster all over you. She loved you in life, loved you at the tomb. You showed her your life at resurrection. You showed them you were Lord. Now show your people, the little country church today, and those watching online, that you are not a liar. Every word you said was true. Not one bit of gall came out, one bit of bitterness came out of your mouth. Not one agitation, not not one overreach. Everything you said was true. You're not a lunatic, you're not crazy. You set your face like a gate. Lord, you look... You you kept the faith, you pressed on for the joy that laid before you. You pressed on. Help us grasp lordship. Help us hold on to the fact that the past don't own us no more. We love our families. We want to see our families come to you. Anybody that's gone on, God, we just say thank you for their lives. We'll see them again. But help us serve our purpose in this generation. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, give God praise again.